Um, okay, so great to have you back. Um, we're going to start the breakouts now. So I want to reiterate um, a point that we had made um, earlier in that we really want to hear from you in these breakout discussions. Hopefully these talks were helpful in like setting the stage for lessons learned and planning for the future. Um, but now we really want to hear from you and um, get your input on those plans for the future. So we will move into breakouts. Um, we'll have two breakouts. The first will be on science objectives and the second will be on crew strategies for observations. Um, there'll be three breakout rooms for each of these two topics to just better enable group participation. You're going to be asked the exact same questions, the exact prompts. It's just will offer you more of an opportunity to participate. Um, so the breakout rooms will be chaired and facilitated by the following people. If you get put into breakout room one, Ben Greenhagen will be your chair and Mina Rubio will be helping facilitate in room two, Julie Stobar and Marie Henderson. And in room three, Kelsey, myself and Hunter Vanier will be in those rooms. So Ricky will be pushing those six names into those three rooms. Everyone else, not those six people, will be randomly moved into one of the three breakouts. Um, and then latecomers, if you're late coming back from break, will also be moved randomly into one of those three breakouts. Um, at 310 Eastern, you'll just go straight to break. No need to come back here. Um, and so after the break, please come back here to the main WebEx room at 325 PM Eastern. Um, and Ben Greenhagen, our lead for breakout one, will summarize the results of this topic um, to kick off the second breakout topic. So all you need to know is you'll be randomly pushed into a room, go to break at 310 and come back here to this room at 325. Um, unlike in this main room, you will be able to unmute in the breakout discussions. Um, so everybody will be able to contribute either in the chat or out loud. Um, and again, also after the break, come back here for start to start breakout topic two. Um, okay, so um, Ben, if there's anything you want to say, um, I think, uh, Ricky, if you could promote Ben Greenhagen, you have already. Um, ben, if you want to say anything, please go ahead and I'll leave up the questions here for the first topic. Ben, anything from you? See you unmuted, Ben, but I do not hear you. Okay, I will say for him um, that the main topic for breakout one will back. be. Can you hear me oh yes, we can now. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, so like like I was trying to say, um, so right now we want to focus on science objectives that can be accomplished by crew. So do assume that the objectives that we talk about uh, require active crew participation inside Orion and or Gateway, and that can include Windows, as has been discussed quite a bit so far this afternoon. Um, we don't really want to talk about particular instruments. We want to talk about measurements and science objectives um, or particular engineering properties of, of Ryan or Gateway. But if there are things that you know would be useful to know in order to enable these objectives, we, we do want to record those. And then in terms of leading questions, each of the facilitators will go through these. But similar to what Noah was talking about, there's kind of these different phases, distances um, that uh, might enable specific things. Um, so we'll go through those. Thanks, Ben. So I'll just go back a slide so we have these this up again. Um, so when we give the go, Ricky is going to perform technological magic and you will be pushed into one of three breakout rooms, hopefully with these two people in each one of those rooms. Um, and so we will see you shortly. And thank you, Ricky, for your magician, your magic work um, and talk to you all at 325 after the break back in this room. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, super successful breakouts. We just met with the, the three breakout leadership. Um, it sounds like amazing stuff was discussed in all three and it wasn't all the same, which was totally the point. So really psyched about how things went. Um, we're going to just spend the first few minutes of this hour hearing from Ben, who was our lead for the first topic, and he's going to summarize just a quick summary that we all threw together just now from the three breakouts put together before we transition to the second topic. So um, kick it to Ben. All right. Uh, great. Just want to confirm you can hear me. We can and we can see your screen. All right. Great. I'm going to actually try to do this. All right. Yeah. So the um, I kind of broke this down to different parts of the mission phase uh, things uh, we're looking at. So uh, the first uh, topic were geologic kind of mapping perspective surface observations. 
Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion, sounds like, in all the breakout groups in terms of limb observations or specifically things with low incident lighting that can highlight differences in textures. Uh, this can be really important for identifying different geologic units. One thing we do need to understand, though, is when we do have these types of observations, what is that really telling us about different units? Um, we expect that there will be differences, but we need to know how to interpret them. Uh, this is especially true of Gateway, which will be up, astronauts will be on and we'll have lots and lots of opportunities to see limbs like this. Um, and one of the concerns there is that if we are using handheld cameras, um, it, they may be more limited in terms of coverage uh, for robotic observations, but they could enable new types of viewing geometries or make those new viewing geometries a little bit more routine. Um, and there was a comment here that Calibrated cameras are, are important, and I have a, a further bullet a little bit further down about talking about calibration. Um, color differences, and the, especially the differences that are visible to eyes, sounds like that was also something that was discussed in all three breakouts. In my breakout especially, we uh, we mentioned that the, there's these hematite detections near the poles. Um, this could be a very uh, reddish color mineral and might be something that's especially uh, easy for eyes to pull out relative to the, the background regolith or surface cover. Um, but different types of volcanism and different features will also have these types of color variations. Um, and this might be something also uh, that we'll, we'll mention that there's there's cases where you might want to have different astronauts looking at these because different astronauts may have different abilities to pull out these, these colors as well. Uh, in terms of volcanism, uh, specific uh, features such as wrinkle bridges and lava flow interactions might be more easily discernible from these perspectives and these types of viewing angles. And there's a, a lot of direct comparisons that could be done with the uh, Earth volcanism that has been observed from ISS, including some of the things um, that Jessica Watkins has done that were mentioned earlier. For tectonics, you can look for landslides, including recent landslides. And when you do detect these, you want to observe that fresh morphology uh, over time, either within the mission and especially uh, between missions to see what has changed. Um, you also want to look at past landing sites and see how they've been changing, not especially the Apollo sites, because that gives you the longest time base. But if new landing sites that might be changing more quickly would also be of interest to look at. Uh, and if you can collect far side images that are complementary to the types of uh, near side observations we have in telescopes, that also would provide a unique data set um, that would be very useful. Um, looking at the polar regions, this is something, at least in my group, we were uh, we didn't know what the answer was in terms of what, what is better here, the human eye or cameras. Um, astronauts have reported it actually takes time to adjust between daytime, nighttime scenes, or looking at the surface and looking at stars. Um, so the, the proximity of these of the shadows um, to illuminated regions, um, is the human eye able to see more? Uh, can the Nikon camera see more? Um, what's the compar capabilities compared to LROC shadow cam? Something to be looked at in addition. Moving a little bit further away from that kind of geologic perspective. There is discussion of exosphere phenomenon, including dust lofty and horizon glow. These all require backlit solar geometries. So something to keep in mind um, that the sun is just below the horizon and coming up above the horizon when you make these. You do want to do them over time. We want to see if that Apollo 15 observation can be repeated and do it with multiple crew members that might be pulling out different, um, different aspects from the scene. For impact flashes, um, these could potentially be resource intensive because ideally you would just sit and stare uh, at the surface. So if you are using a handheld camera, um, is this really worth it? Uh, but then we did have a little bit of discussion of what they do on ISS, which includes a tripod mount and using this time lapse function in order to do some of this imaging um, and also has a stray light hood. So if that type of setup is available for um, Orion and Gateway, um, that makes these uh, more viable observations. There are clouds of cometary dust and potentially mini moons, um, temporary mini moons at L4 and L5. Viewing these from uh, L1 or lunar vicinity gives you a very unique perspective and a longer dwell time on it than you would have from low Earth orbit. And of course, no atmosphere to look through, so that might make those observations especially interesting. Additional uh, astronomical observations from ISS, they photograph the moon and star fields, um, and you could simulate do um, not the moon, but star fields and other planetary objects from Orion and Gateway. You could also look at stellar occultations using the video function without having to worry about atmospheric disruptions. Uh, we, In my breakout, at least, we talked a tiny bit beyond cameras. Some of the advantages you can get from hyperspectral image, imagers. We did limit our discussion to things for which there are options available. And there are some uh, uh, hyperspectral imagers that are used for, for agriculture, especially. 
um, that could be enabling to a wide range of composition studies. Similarly, for thermal infrared cameras, there's cost options, including cell phone versions and handheld versions um, that could be used to look at how uh, regular temperatures and rock temperatures respond going into shadow. In terms of Earth vicinity, um, there's a ton of comparison to what's been done in ISS and even some uh, to Apollo that could be better looked at. Um, but at least in our breakout, you know, we uh, we need to better understand what's been done to date and what's been especially successful. And one of the things that's brought up is how ISS is used. Um, uh, scientists and students at universities can participate and request targets. Maybe this is something that could be expanded to Gateway, especially since there will be um, longer periods of time available. There are some unique perspectives. Uh, Orion and Gateway can capture the full disk Earth with Aurora, and so there's time and space phenomenon that can be looked at. Um, I think it'd be really awesome to observe Earth eclipses um, from either lunar vicinity or L1 um, and see what, what can be um, taken from that data. Uh, human light sources viewed from a distance um, was something that was mentioned in, uh, I think, Chelsea, uh, Kelsey's group. Um, and, uh, and then also, what about less dynamic process and clean geologic process. There's examples of delta formation interaction with humans and geology, and that's actually what got us thinking about looking at, at past uh, Apollo landing sites. Um, and then also, when you are viewing the Earth, can you coordinate your viewing perspective similar to Apollo to provide that, that long temporal baseline uh, between those observations? From low lunar orbit, we were thinking a little bit about the human uh, landing system perspective which might even be a little bit more analogous to ISS than um, Orion and Gateway are, uh, but need to understand a lot more about the specifics of that. Uh, we did talk a little bit about the calibration of the camera itself. Uh, we felt in our group that it's really important <laughs> and, that, and that it is possible, but takes time and effort. Uh, in terms of using calibration sources, you can use the moon itself, you can use stars, uh, you potentially use ex exterior parts of the spacecraft. And it sounds like in Julie's uh, session, there's some discussion about observing the spacecraft to see if parts change over the course of the mission as well, which could be interesting. Um, but I think there, there does need to be a, a little bit more study about what's possible both with and without uh, calibration. And it sounds like Julie's group also mentioned bringing along a polarization filter um, to provide additional information. And then Kelsey's group had a big old bullet right at the top that said, allow time for discovery and opportunistic imaging. And that seems really important as well. 